Okay, so a little bit about me. My name is Michelle Crow, and I'm the Southern Arizona Director for Children's Action Alliance. I've been in that role since 2015, so probably a lot of my comments are going to be influenced by the last eight years and whether we're better or worse or, you know, how it was then versus now. Before that, I'll just really briefly say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm about 50 years old and I graduated college, as you heard, and went straight into work at a domestic violence shelter working with women and children needing to find independence and, and escape violence. And pretty soon thereafter, some number of years after, you start to recognize when you're working with families one-on-one, -on -one, these these patterns, right, of things that are, are, are barriers or are, that need to be changed upstream, right? And so you kind of can make a decision to continue to help families one-on-one -on -one or go upstream. I guess the expression is, um, you know, the baby's being thrown into the river. Do you want to change and make policy shifts or do you want to serve um, families one-on-one? -on -one? So after that, I went and I worked uh, for a member of Congress and um, since then have done a number of um, campaigns, both issue-based and candidate-based, and then um, kind of fell into this area of helping nonprofits communicate and um, advocate for some changes, and then eventually came to work for Children's Action Alliance. So all that, and plus my own personal lived experiences that inspired me to get into this work is uh, a big part of probably what you'll see here today. In terms of Children's Action Alliance, uh, we are, this might surprise you as I get into the politics of this, but we are a nonprofit 501c3, which means we do a lot of education. We do a little bit of quote unquote lobbying and we stay well within the, the guidelines of the IRS in terms of how much of that we can do. We are also very much nonpartisan organization. We were established 33 years ago up in the Phoenix capital by community leaders who started to recognize that, boy, there sure is a lot of lobbyists up at the legislature, but kids are too young to have their own lobbyists, and it was really influencing the decisions that policymakers were making and really felt like children needed a voice at the state capitol. It's a large part of what we do is we try to um, influence and educate policymakers at the at the state capitol. But since then, our mission and reach has really grown a bit over those 33 years. So now we're not only an advocate at the state, but also for the well-being of kids in local jurisdiction decision making. And um, more recently, as Arizona has become a swing state and a very critical vote. In the Senate, I've uh, been called upon quite a bit um, to engage in uh, federal advocacy as well, too. So that's kind of where we are. This is our vision as an organization. We envision an Arizona where all children and families thrive. Um, how we go about that is we seek to be an independent voice that identifies and eliminates barriers to the well being of children and families. And I want to just pause and say that that piece right there about eliminate barriers to just really focus on that because I feel like that's the lion's share of what we do in terms of our work. We do a lot of it that's um, certainly we're crunching data and we're looking at who's most impacted and what shifts need to happen from a data standpoint. I'll talk about that in a moment. But we do a lot of listening um, and focus groups and you'll hear us very often if we don't just flat out say what's the barrier a lot of questions that are like, what's the, where's the stuck points? What's the things that need to get out of the way? And what are the things that we need to move? And then we, I would just say the, the final part is that we, um, we don't do this alone. Uh, we're a staff of, I want to say about 15. But what we do is we, co we create coalitions, many, many, many partners, and try to elevate voices from many different spheres to advocate on the issues to improve the lives of uh, kids and families. Okay, so Children's Action Alliance, kind of historically we've always had these three buckets that we were trying to impact, right? Children's health and access to children's health, children's education, so that could be K-12 or early childhood education, 
and then there's security and well-being, which generally falls in around um, the child welfare system advocacy and around juvenile justice issues. But overall, we um, we basically work to create an Arizona where every child is safe, loved, and has access to quality education and affordable health care. And then there are, in 33 years, a lot of policy successes. So I'll be honest, um, this might get a little too wonky. Feel free to be like, OK, enough with the policy wonkiness, or tell me if you want more. But I just picked a few <laughs> to kind of illustrate the impact of some of our work. By no means all of them, but these are some of the, the recent or the, most, or the biggest ones. But kids care. Affordable health coverage now covers about 35,000 children today. Um, Low-income working families, we were instrumental in, in establishing that in Arizona back in, I think it was like 1999. After the Great Recession, um, there was an enrollment freeze and it dwindled to almost zero. And then there was this absolute epic battle that was amazing <laughs> legislative maneuvering that unfroze kids care right after I was hired. It was just uh, really inspirational to watch how um, this organization did this. And you know, I was part of you know mobilizing coalitions and voices from Southern Arizona to um, unfreeze kids care and reestablish it again. And so today we 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 have the children's health insurance program, which is known as kids care here in Arizona. The federal government, as you may or may not know, deployed a lot of funding throughout the pandemic. And one of those was child in the area of child care, which was really on the edge before the pandemic, but certainly collapsing entirely during the pandemic. We do our own advocacy, but we're also part of a broader coalition called ZECA. Early Learning Coalition, Arizona Early Learning Coalition, and oftentimes um, state lawmakers really s turn to us to figure out how to best use infusions of funds to impact the situation. And so I think I just summarized by saying that uh, that was our role, was really saying it's, this is a serious crisis and this is how we think you can um, best distribute the funds and, and certainly coalescing groups around issues as well too. The other piece that we did legislatively a few years ago is we want to not only have adequate child care uh, opportunities for kids in Arizona, but we want high quality early childhood education. Uh, the research is very, very clear. The brain develops quickest and fastest in the first three years of life, five years of life, and, and the environment that you would want a child to be exploring in that costs more, right? And so we, there's a, um, some bumps for if you are pers on that quality first and improvement system. Um, we've done a ton of work around increasing financial supports and to transition foster age youth. During, again, during the Great Recession of 2008-2009, wow, there was a lot of cuts in the foster system. And it's inadequate uh, for, for kids to support themselves in the, the financial supports, but also the transition itself is abrupt. I will use the word abrupt and without enough supports. We have a group called FAS, Fostering Arizona Advocates, that is basically a, a small board, children that have aged out of the foster system, and they advise our FAS legislative advocacy agenda and they kind of look back over their life and, and say, these are the things that would have helped me. Um, and some of those are about normalizing you know, teen experiences and learning to drive and being able to get your driver's license. Um, part of that is moving from um, you know, a, a living situation, maybe it's congregate care or maybe you're, you know, you're in a foster care home, but then suddenly being thrust into adulthood without parental support um, and uh, understanding kind of those transitions. So they have a ton of amazing, great ideas. And so they, they tend to drive the foster care, um, the older foster care uh, legislative agenda for us. The other one we had was, um, I think many of you know that because of the Obamacare, kids can stay on their parents' health insurance until the age of 26. 
um, because foster kids are technically kids of the state, um, they, um, there's a program called Yadi, and so we were able to make some um, changes so that kids could stay on Yadi until age 26, most recently in the, transition, in the legislature. Um, another big issue for us has been, I don't know if you know this, but over, about over half of the kids that are removed from their homes are placed in what's called kinship caregiver homes. It's a huge number, yeah, particularly in Arizona. However, uh, those families that, that are taken kids that were removed by DCS that are related, there's a huge disparity in the amount of financial supports. Um, and services that they receive. So just for an example, if a child um, previous to this change was um, taken from a home and placed with grandma, that home would receive about $75 kinship care stipend. A community foster home, um, the average was about uh, 686 per month. It's a huge gap, right? And so we worked with this amazing group of grandmas that have been this change right here, let me just tell you, it took 12 years. <laughs> None of this is quick and easy, right? But they got pissed off, they met each other in a support group, and they said, this is not fair. And uh, the initial legislation that they proposed is that they would get $300 a month in, in support. And it took them 12 years of us just chipping away to get there. So this last legislative session, with ASCA's help, we were able to finally reach that $300. It's still not the same, but the other angle we're coming at this as with, we're making it easier for family members to become licensed, right? So if you think about it, if you're gonna become a foster parent, it's before the child's with you and you go through this training program and, and you get licensed and all this is in place beforehand. Oftentimes for half of the families, the kinship families, this is a 3 a.m. phone call. You're suddenly, maybe you're living in a community that doesn't allow you to have kids, right? And you're, or you don't have enough bedrooms or beds or, you know, if the child has special needs and you're having to make that change very quickly. And oftentimes people are spending down their retirement income because they're not getting enough financial support. The best path would be to get them licensed, formally licensed, as a foster family so they could get that full 686. And so we've spent a lot of time in conversation um, trying to figure out what are, the, what are the hiccups and what is the decision making process and why is that, you know, where are the barriers and the hurdles for families, kinship families in particular, to become licensed and um, been working with the department to, to, to have that happen quicker um, so that we can get families to parity and get um, sufficient financial resources for them to raise, raise those kiddos. This was a really fun one near and dear to my heart. We know that prevention works better and so prevention programs has been a really big important part of what we do. Um, families are identified in the hospital um, as having a number of, you know, any one of a number of high risk factors and they say yes I need support as a parent and then they can get this home visitation service until the child turns five or until they um, no longer need it. Anyway a lot of work in this last most recent legislative session we, we partnered with the Women's Foundation of Southern Arizona who hired a lobbyist and um, we got ten million dollars to expand that um, across the state, um, doubling services to families. And the, the emphasis was particularly on moving from serving families in urban areas to expanding into work. The other thing I'll just say really quickly without, getting, without complicating things too much is that we also have an affiliate organization, I'll, I'll address this in a minute, called Arizona Center for Economic Progress. Um, so I'm gonna throw in some of their policy wins as well too and then maybe when we get to the Q&A or maybe you guys want to invite another speaker back to dig into their work a little bit more. Okay so Arizona for a long time legislators have said look here's how this works we create economic opportunity and prosperity by cutting taxes and if we cut taxes then we create opportunities and businesses grow 
and that was the only tool in their toolbox. What that ends up happening, and we've done a ton of reports looking at other states, like Kansas, for example, that really, like, you bankrupt your state and you end up not having a sufficient amount of money, particularly in the, in the dips of the economy, right, to pay for your education and your DES caseworker, or DCS caseworkers, and your roads, and your, right, like, you just really bankrupt the state. And so we felt the need to communicate that there's another way to create prosperity and economic growth in, in the state of Arizona. And so we developed the Arizona Center for Economic Progress. And it's about taking revenue and making strategic targeted investments and creating opportunities for people. And that might be opportunity to go to community college or higher education or access childcare or all the various things that are, are the things that help people succeed. But it's, a, it's an investment in those building blocks of our economy. Before we could get to that, uh, we spent a lot of time blocking any new tax cuts and credits. Just like stop the bleeding. <laughs> it was a pretty dangerous road there. A uh, patient was on life support and we just had to stop that. And so the first years of existence, just, you know, the wins were we killed this many tax cuts and, and credits and kept revenue. And then later on, we started to do proactive revenue campaigns targeted at a particular thing. So things, for example, like the ballot initiative 208, but it dramatically increased funding to schools with this surcharge on, on wealthier taxpayers. We led that. We won that. The, uh, it was really historic. The, um, the same thing happened. We did not have farewell in the Supreme Court, which our governor appointed many members to the Supreme Court. Uh, the same thing happened with the flat tax. He went a different, the pre previous governor went a different direction and lowered uh, taxes to 2.5% across the board. We're quite concerned, as, as many people are predicting, that we'll head into an economic slowdown or recession, hopefully not, but that we're going to run into a circumstance that was very similar to 2008, 2009 in terms of just really drastic, difficult decisions that actually, frankly, can I just say, make things more expensive, <laughs> right? Thanks. Right? So, you know, like removing kids from homes is much more expensive than just creating healthy environments. So everything that is a sort of a knee-jerk reaction to a dropping revenue is not actually saving the state money in the long run. But essentially, Children's Action Alliance, we believe healthcare should be accessible, affordable, and, ac and accountable, right? It's public funds that we're primarily working with, bolsters you know, kids and families' well-being and the economy, and improves their financial prospects for um, years to come. So, for example, kids do better in school. They're most more likely to graduate from high school. They earn more as adults and have healthier babies than their peers that do not have health coverage as children. So we uh, feel it's um, important to do all of the above. And you'll see these uh, themes of policy recommendations that we can do to make it more affordable, more accessible, and more accountable often in our in our policy work. But first let me just give you, I, I tried to do this in each of the three bucket areas, just fast facts that you might find interesting nationally. Um, and again, I just want to say this, particularly in the healthcare portion of my presentation, this is pre-pandemic numbers. This is 2019 numbers. It would be too complicated to try to talk about what happened during the pandemic. So I'm just going to rely on pre-pandemic numbers. But nationally, 5.2% of all children are uninsured, and that is the impetus to way back when, when Senator Hillary Clinton and I want to say it was Orin, Orwin Hatch created the Children's Health Insurance Program in the 90s was, um, and what was interesting, this isn't necessarily the case in our state, but it was really just like a no-brainer. Um, it was a bipartisan it was not controversial. Both parties overwhelmingly vote for reauthorizations of children's health insurance. 
the goal is to get to 100% of kids having health insurance. In Arizona, 9.2% of all children in Arizona are uninsured. So we trail the national average. We're um, fourth worst in all the states if we include DC. If you want a new uh, actual raw number, we're chasing 161 kids in, in Arizona that don't have health coverage and trying to find a mean. We did really, really well. Uh, we reached a record low in 2016, uh, both nationally and within Arizona, but since then um, it has increased significantly. I also want to take a moment to say that a lot of what we do is um, disaggregate data to see which uh, community populations are most impacted and where the disparities are. So we will take all those numbers and we will look at the uninsured rate by race and ethnicity. And as you can see by the breakdown, here's a couple interesting pieces as well too. American Indian Alaska Native, this is in Arizona, one in four in Arizona are uninsured. And we also just want to reiterate that health care delivered through IHS is not insurance. It's health care. It's a federal system that is chronically underfunded. And that also needs to be remedied, and we advocate for that as well, too. But there is a saying um, that if you're going to get sick and use IHS, you want to do it before July, because generally they've used up all the monies. And so um, we, we encourage all members to also see if they're eligible for Medicaid and or kids care, um, because oftentimes they're not on the reservation, they're not nearby an Indian health center, or as more and more tribes take over the delivery of, of those health care services. Sometimes we're talking with folks that live in Tucson, but they can't go to cells because they're really Navajo, so they're gonna have to travel all the way up to Chinle to get, if you use the system. And so we can get insurance through Medicaid, they can also just visit El Rio establish that. I will also say that the rate and number of uninsured um, has doubled in recent years. And then the other big number that kind of jumps out there is Hispanic Latino families. I'll just say that our income eligibility currently goes up to 200% federal poverty level and we have worked for years and years and years to get it to the federal allowable, you can go up to 300%, and I have a slide here that shows you other states that do this, but there's a, there's a gap between kind of the median income of the area and this 200% ceiling that makes, is where we're trying to focus quite a bit of attention because that's where people are not getting health insurance, where kids are not getting health insurance. So. We found that Hispanic and Latino families are more likely to be in the workforce, um, but less likely in their job or, or employment to be eligible or in a job that provides health insurance. And so they're working, and so they're right above that, that level. Make up. There's this, this new term now called the political determinants of health. I think probably people have heard about the social determinants of health quite a bit. The political determinants of health, um, as Daniel Dawes talks about in 2020, is basically the political process of structuring relationships, distributing resources, administering power, and operating in ways that mutually reinforce or influence one another to shape available opportunities that either advance health equity or exacerbate health inequities. Um, and you see some of that with this slide, but you also see it here, right? So this is a history, I couldn't get it all on the, the sheet here, but bear with me. This is a, a history of decisions by our policymakers. The first is the kids care enrollment freeze, right? And so this yellow line that you see is us always chasing the national average, all of us trying to move up to 100% <coughs> coverage. They, they in, but you know, we dip and we create greater chasms during the enrollment freeze. We get it restored in 2016. 
But then, you know, there was a significant change happened in 2016 at the federal level and federal decision making. So, you know, healthcare marketing was cut by for um, by 91 percent. Partnerships to promote the enrollment was cut. Contracts to for state support ended. And open enrollment periods were squished by half. Sunday enrollment was cut. That was a big source of getting communities to apply was right after church. The pastor could do it from the pulpit. Navigator funding was cut across the U.S. by 40%. And Navigator funds, those are the people that help you figure out how to get health insurance. Incredibly complicated, but um, was cut by 85%. And the state has zero investment in trying to help um, their population become and find health insurance. So they have in the zero dollars spin in the game. And so the decisions that are being made by policymakers are some of the barriers that we want to eradicate as we move forward so we can get all the kids. I'm gonna um, switch gears here and move to the second bucket. Early childhood care and education, I already mentioned it's, it's the very foundation that shapes a child's brain and their future um, readiness for school and it's even been shown to affect overall income later on in life. And so we work to advance policies that make more investments in early childhood for the, for the long run. Um, uh, for every dollar spent, on early childhood, it's an ROI of $16 back for every dollar we can get into the system. Here's some more fun facts for you guys. In Arizona, there, um, if you look at the census data, there are 304, over 304,000 uh, children under the age of five, I believe is what this is, um, that need child care. However, there's only 234 child care slots, which means there's a very quick deficit, as you're doing the math here, of 76,000 children who are need in child care but do not have access to it. And I don't know how many of you have grandkids or, or work with um, families, but if you've looked for child care recently to go back to work post-pandemic, it is not an easy experience to find safe, reliable, affordable, quality child care. So it's, it's a, that's it. The other thing is it tends to be clustered primarily in urban areas of, of Tucson and, and Maricopa. And if you look at the map, um, particularly in rural areas, um, and also parts, big swaths of, of urban areas as well too. I should have just indicate it's rural. But you know, I think they've calculated that about 50% of the state is what's called a child care desert, meaning that there is no child care provider within, uh, I'm gonna forget, some number of miles from your, from your home. A while back, business leaders and advocates, early childhood educators came together. Well, actually it wasn't just, it was education advocates, I could say, because it goes all the way up to post attainment. And they said, look, let's just, let's, we can't seem to agree on how we get there, but let's agree on the goal of what this new 21st century economy requires for our kids and so they came up with the Arizona early learning progress meter I'll show you a, a thing in a moment but the goal is to have 35 percent of all three and four year old children enrolled in quality early learning settings by 2030 and so we're going to work together to get to the point that by 2030 we get to 35 percent we are at 17 percent we actually used to be better um, we were in the low 20s but we've actually gone backwards since i've been working here <laughs> so it's a lot of this progress meter stuff recently particularly because of the covid and particularly because i have to tell you the pandemic was really hard on on child care almost wiped the whole system out we've we've gone backwards instead of forwards I think most people know this, but to put a child in childcare and to work full time is equivalent to the cost of a college tuition. So you have families essentially paying that at the beginning, and then paying that at the at the, at the other bookend of the child's life. This I mentioned the um, progress meter, and I don't know if folks know about this, but this was the agreed upon goals. Business leaders, advocates, you know, the governor, 
everybody came on board and said, okay, this is what we think we need. Um, and, you know, in today's economy, nearly 70% of jobs require this kind of training and investment. The numbers that have particularly gone down, because I was going back to 2018 data as I was looking over this this morning, you know, this quality, uh, children in quality early learning environments, 24%, um, 21%, now 17%. And we really want to go the other way to 35%. The other one that is really dipping, was it third grade reading, or I think it might be eighth grade math, is also. This is an interesting um, graph that I wanted to talk about. Like when we're working with providers and we're working with families and we're looking at, okay, where are the stuck points? This is the stuck point that's really screaming at us right now. We have sufficient funding for the first time in a long time to pay the right reimbursement rate for kids to attend uh, early learning, and I can go into that in a little bit. We have a lot of um, attention because employers can't hire people. <laughs> the primary care workers, generally women, left the workforce in droves during the pandemic, and it's really hampering our economy. So we like to say child care is the work that makes the economy work, <laughs> right, for families. But the workforce shortage, this is a list of the impacts of the pandemic. Um, it looks at a comparison of employment from March 2020 before the pandemic started to 2022. And you'll see, I don't know if you can see this, but these up here are different professions that have grown. And these are the deficits in professions. And at the very bottom is um, childcare workers. We cannot get childcare workers to come back. So we have available space and and funding and we've got it all figured out except um, we don't have enough workers and so uh, providers can't accept more kids until we uh, get more child care folks um, put back into the system I'm trying to remember why i included this but i just i guess probably just to make the point that it's an incredibly complicated system it is not simple, it is not easy, and there are, it braids, it probably you know, looks like some type of cellular division. <laughs> um, so you have you know, multiple funding sources going through multiple agencies. Primarily the biggest one sometimes being parents and caregivers. This is something that is paid for out of their pocket. And I guess I would wager to say that this is not something that's going to ever be fixed until we recognize uh, that this doesn't math out, is my favorite phrase mm -hmm. the youngsters are saying these days is like, hey, hey miss, that doesn't math out. This doesn't math out unless we have significant public investment um, given the wages that families uh, face, particularly when they have young children. So moving forward, what to know on the policy landscape. I talked a little bit about the progress meter, and we're going backwards, so we got a lot of catching up to do. The other thing is I mentioned we had a huge, thank God, uh, infusion of federal funds. Um, when I first started this job back in 2015, oh my Lord, this, this was in such a crisis. I used to have this child care provider, we would go and we would, his name was Bill Burke, we'd go around and we'd, we'd, we'd talk with policymakers and we'd do site visits and we'd bring them to see uh, what we were talking about. But he actually had a flashcard presentation that was just drove the point home, where he says like, okay, here's minimum wage at the time, right? And here's the reimbursement rate that you give me and so if you can, let me quickly do the math for you that there's a huge deficit here, right? Like, by law, I have to pay this. My employees are really worth this. And particularly now, to incentivize employees to come back, we have to pay higher and start to include health insurance and all that kind of stuff. But at the time, if you were just doing calculations by, by minimum wage, which is not certainly what, what they're worth, and then what the state reimbursed child care providers, there was, it just didn't map out. And it really just doesn't, right? So for example, when I, what, how it works with public funding is they go out and every two years they do a market rate survey and they find out how much it costs in all the various areas of Arizona. 
and then we receive federal dollars. And when we agree to take those federal dollars, we agree to the federal government that we're gonna pay 75% of that market rate survey. And for a long time, Arizona just ignored that. So when I started, we were paying 18%. And we worked really, really, really hard at the legislature, and I think we got it up to 20-some percent or something. It wasn't until we got these federal funds and this huge coalition of people really trying to put their heads together and fix this that we're actually now finally up to 75% compliance with the federal regulations. And not only that, we also have the tiered reimbursement and higher reimbursement rates for some of the areas like infants and toddlers um, rural areas, high quality, they get additional funds to incentivize because there's a real dearth of that as well too. But unfortunately that goes away in 2024 and we're uh, not really sure that Congress is going to reauthorize it. We hope that they do, um, but we are facing a very, very steep um, funding cliff in that regard. I think I mentioned most of this. I would like to just say that basically child care and the economy and this whole system for far too long has been held together on the backs of primarily women and honestly, uh, especially women of color that have gone uncompensated for work or underpaid and um, without health insurance. And that it won't be solved without, I mentioned this, significant cultural, political shifts in the way we consider the importance of, of child care to our economy and our public funding. To briefly go into child welfare, mostly, because this is kind of our third bucket. Just a bunch of children in foster care in Arizona. That's far too many kids to be in foster care. I mentioned this earlier, but 51% of those are actually placed with their grandparents or other kins, not in what we call community-based foster homes. Um, the, the national Average, the rate at is 32%. So you'll see that Arizona relies much stronger on placing kids in kinship family homes. It's the right decision because um, kids do better in a family setting and with people they know. Um, however, we don't yet have appropriate financial and wraparound supports for those 51%. And so, so the same child could receive zero support here right, or very little support here, be removed and put in a foster care a home and receive a much higher support. Anyway, I could go on, on and on about this. And it's the same child, right? It's just all in where they're placed. Arizona also has a significant issue in terms of systemic bias around um, kids in foster care. So particularly in Arizona, black children are four times more likely than white children to enter foster care. The other thing that I'll just say is that, I don't know if you guys know this, but neglect is the highest reason for system involvement, not physical abuse or sexual abuse, but neglect. And I have a slide to, to talk about that in a moment. Um, but just to dig into a little bit about, you know, overwhelmingly system involvement is due to reports of neglect, not physical or sexual abuse. The hotline, the crisis hotline, receives over 150,000 calls every year. Uh, the vast majority, as you can see from this, are, are neglect um, that they're sorting through or reports of neglect. And of those children that enter foster care, so this is just the, the actual, you know, this number of above 90% of the calls uh, in Arizona. Arizona's blue and, and then orange is the U.S. average. And of those kids that enter foster care, neglect is cited as the um, reason 87% of the time. 87% of the time. So who is impacted the most by the child welfare system? Part of it is sort of like what is the proportion of the population here in Arizona split between Latino and Caucasian to a large degree. But for example, if you look Blue is the foster care population. I also included on this chart what is their overall share of the Arizona population. When you look at this, the black families here, as a, they're disproportionately involved in the child welfare system compared to 
their share of the population. And so, um, policed in kind of an over-policed community in a lot of ways. Particularly in Maricopa County, there was, and you know, generally I would say in, in Pima as well too, but Maricopa there was a particular sort of earth-shattering study that has been the subject of many, many news articles. You know, looking at the cumulative risk of the system that we've created, that contact by age 18 impact of the system grows exponentially, right? So children in Maricopa County have the greatest risk among 20 largest metro areas in the U.S. of being sent into foster care and having their parents' legal rights terminated. So by age 18, Four out, of every four out of every 10 children in Maricopa County will at one time in their life be uh, part of an investigation. And then uh, for black children in Maricopa, that number is more than six out of 10. It's really, yeah, no, it's startling. It's just really, you know, call, it's a call to action. People should be up in arms about this. Moving forward, there's some themes in trying to rethink and reimagine the child welfare system from being one of child protection, child welfare, and turning into a more encompassing child well-being system, right? So those three components are around the trauma of family separation, the poverty-related poverty neglect, and um, community co-design. So first I'll just talk a little bit about the family separation and the trauma that occurs when that happens. They've done research, and uh, it's very clear. Children generally suffer worse outcomes when they've been removed from a home than if they were allowed to remain in marginal homes. They've done studies of similarly situated children, those with social service involvement, uh, intense supports with social service involvement, uh, facing possible removal, and then children who were there, in fact, removed and placed in other homes. And those that were removed have two to three times higher delinquency rates. Of all the citation, academic citations for these, but you probably don't want me to list all that. They have higher teen birth rates. They have lower earnings as adults. They're two to three more times uh, more likely to enter the criminal justice system as adults. They're twice as likely to have learning disabilities and developmental delay, delays. They're six times more likely to have behavioral problems. As adults, they're more likely to have substance abuse, um, related disorders, psychotic or bipolar disorders, and depression, anxiety uh, disorders. And as adults, have arrest rates two to three times higher and are more likely to have criminal convictions for violent offenses. So again, uh, research is clear. The outcomes are generally better if we can provide services and supports and help children remain in families of origin. And then if that is not the case, the outcomes are far better when children are placed with kin and placed with their siblings in a, in a home-based setting. And certainly, congregate care is not generally good outcomes for kids. Um, there's been a ton of research lately looking at, because obviously <laughs> the vast number of reports in kids entering child welfare system is due to poverty, and so the relationship between poverty, and so this was one by, this was researched by the Morrison Institute of Public Policy, a report that came out. I mean, sometimes when you're looking at some of these situations, it's very hard to distinguish between neglect and poverty, right? <coughs> And, and what does that family and what does that intervention need? Does the child need to be removed from the home or do we need to build adequate safety supports and case management supports and parent aid um, in, in, in a, um, instead of removing a child from a home? So um, this was just a quote from the Morrison Institute, policymakers and research must ask, is the child not eating enough because the parent is negligent or because the family doesn't have enough money to buy food. The effort to protect children cannot include families or punishing families for being poor. The other thing that we see, I mean, I think we knew this just sort of anecdotally talking with families, but Chapin Hill 
finally did very formal research around the the opposite is true that if you can make political decisions around safety net supports and financial supports you can actually lower um, system involvement and so this was um, one of my favorites so when family economic security is addressed through fiscal supports neglect and child welfare involvement decreases and they've shown this so for example to be more specific a one dollar increase in the minimum wage is associated with a 10.9 percent decline in neglect reports involving young children when you have a state that has more generous food stamp benefits it leads to fewer reports of child maltreatment and less use of foster care the earned income tax credit and child tax credits are also associated with reductions in child maltreatment reports as well as the state earned income tax which is provided in 29 states on top of the federal clip credit which our governor also just proposed in her state of the state and budget release that she would also like to make Arizona number 30 so excited about that the other the third piece sort of looking forward to having better outcomes for kids is that it's been I don't know we've discovered that co-design which is a methodology that includes people with relevant lived experience as equal partners with the professionals in conceptualizing design and development of the new system is what would create a better system so for example the work that we do with FAS, fostering arizona advocates of kids that have um, aged out of foster care is a good example of, of system co-design there's also a broader collaborative of which my colleague molly um, who's the child welfare director policy director here in arizona called thriving families safer children initiative so, I'm running out of time. What time am I supposed to stop? Anytime. <laughs> How long does your, do, is there about an hour? About an hour. We've been at it about, just about an hour. So. Oh, I know, but how long does your meeting go? Until you're finished. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds awful. It sounds like you're. <laughs> well, you might go to question and answer.